everyone. Uh, great to see you all at Q2B and very excited to be closing this out. My name is Anastasia Marchenkova. I'm a research engineer scientist at Bleximo and I've spent the last decade in various parts of quantum computing and information from neutral atoms, trapped ions, and now in superconducting qubits. And I'm very excited. Uh, you know, 10 years ago I was taking the physics GRE and very sad about my scores, wondering if I get into grad school and this year I get to be up on stage with Scott Aronson. <laughs> I've never taken a physics GRE. I'm not oh, sure I could wow. pass one. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. Well, go. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your latest well, work. I, 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 I took the computer science GRE. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, that I, I uh, came into quantum computing entirely from the, the math and CS direction and got very excited that uh, it, was, it was just vectors and matrices. You know, that was all I needed to know to start working on quantum algorithms. Now, eventually, after I'd been in this field for long enough and hung out with enough physicists, at some point I picked up what a Hamiltonian was, and then I learned what a boson and a fermion was. Now I'm trying to learn what ADS-CFT is, and then, you know, a little bit about uh, what a black hole is. Okay, but, uh, you know, I, I just sort of pick up my physics on the streets. Uh, uh, um, now, uh, in terms of uh, my uh, recent work, I happen to be uh, on leave this year from my normal job at uh, you know, teaching uh, computer science at UT Austin. Uh, I am uh, working for OpenAI, which is uh, based in San Francisco, on uh, the uh, theoretical foundations of AI safety. Okay, such as uh, if any of you have tried out uh, GPT, uh, you know, how can we prevent it from being misused? How can we prevent every student in the world from uh, 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 using it to write their term paper? Okay, so, uh, um, you know, that has very little to do with quantum computing, and I, you know, uh, uh, quantum computing was my first love, and I uh, intend to come back to it, but uh, yeah, that, that's, that's some of what I've been thinking about. Um, you know, and, and uh, I also continue to work with my students and postdocs. Uh, uh, we have some, some neat projects, uh, one of them about reconstructing the bulk in, in quantum gravity. Uh, I continue to think about quantum supremacy experiments. Uh, how can we make them uh, uh, easier to verify the results using a classical computer? Um, you know, how can we use them for, uh, you know, certified random bits or for other purposes? Uh, so, yeah, those are, those are uh, the quantum things that I uh, continue to think about. Great. So we're definitely going to get a little bit into the wormholes um, and the work on OpenAI. But first, want to talk a little bit about the quantum space and what do you think are the most exciting developments this year in the quantum space? Yeah, well, I mean, a major milestone in the past year was the uh, proof of the uh, so-called NLTS conjecture. Uh, which uh, showed how entanglement can survive uh, even at finite temperature, um, you know, like very large amounts of entanglement. Uh, it's, you know, a major step toward potentially proving this uh, quantum PCP theorem, um, which has, uh, you know, been a central problem in the field since uh, 2005 or so. Um, now, I was also super excited uh, this past spring by a breakthrough of uh, Yamakawa and Jandri. Uh, and so they've given sort of an entirely new type of exponential quantum speed up. Um, not yet for a, a directly useful problem, but uh, it is uh, a, an exponential quantum speed up uh, for uh, a, a search problem, so a problem with verifiable solutions and which works relative to a random oracle. Okay, so a random oracle, you know, is a sort of idealized object, but you can uh, uh, substitute it in real life using a, a pseudo-random function. Okay, so their proposal leads to an experiment that, you know, I mean, I mean, if you had, you would need a fault-tolerant quantum computer, the same kind that you would need for Shor's algorithm, for example. But, uh, you know, if so, you know, this is sort of an entirely new class of exponential quantum speedups, uh, different from, uh, you know, the kind in Shor's algorithm, for example. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, it, it's opened up a whole new avenue of, uh, of, of, of uh, possibilities to play with. Uh, now, there's been progress in the, uh, the past year in uh, 
understanding um, um, quantum algorithms for homology problems, uh, uh, for you know, topological data analysis, uh, both positive and negative. Uh, there have been some dequantizations of, uh, of these uh, uh, um, uh, topological data analysis algorithms. Uh, but there's also uh, uh, like, uh, um, um, approximately a QMA hardness for clique homology, uh, due to, uh, uh, um, in part to uh, Marcos, who now works at QCWare. Um, uh, so, um, you know, so, so, we're, so we're getting a better understanding of that. Uh, there has been progress on um, quantum supremacy experiments. Um, Xanadu did a Gaussian boson sampling experiment uh, in the past year uh, with uh, 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 photon number uh, uh, resolving detectors and uh, uh, you know, tunable beam splitters and uh, hundreds of photons. So uh, that was that was cool, and I think you know established a uh, a state of the art there. But there's also been progress in a negative direction, as many of you have seen. Uh, classical uh, 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 computer scientists have gotten better at figuring out how to take uh, the random circuit sampling experiments, for example, and uh, spoof spoof them classically. Uh, so uh, I would especially mention work by uh, uh, um, Jun Gao and Boaz Barak and others at, at Harvard, uh, and also some, some very new work by uh, Dorita Haranov uh, and Umesh Vazirani and others uh, that have given algorithms, you know, that uh, um, you know, I would say leave the quantum uh, advantage that was achieved by Google a few years ago, you know, they leave it still standing because, you know, either they're less efficient or else they get a benchmark in this linear cross entropy score that is not as good as what the Google uh, experiment demonstrated. Okay, but they leave the claim of quantum supremacy uh, standing uh, more precariously than I would like. Okay, and I would say that the ball is now firmly in the court of the uh, 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 experimentalists to do better quantum supremacy experiments with better gate fidelities, for example, that will put more distance. Because you know we would like quantum supremacy not only to have been achieved, but to stay achieved. Okay, so uh, uh, so so that so that's been uh, another thing. Yes, yeah, so, so th those are some of the developments in the last year. I mean, there was you know major uh, progress in understanding. I think the Comp, uh, um, um, the relation of quantum computing theory to the black hole information problem, uh, uh, work by Daniel Harlow and Netta Engelhart and so forth involving non-isometric codes. You know, and that's led to all sorts of open questions that are interesting to people like me, you know, even if we don't know, you know, e even if we, we didn't care about black holes or string theory or anything like that. Uh, uh, but you know, in, in terms of the the um, more, more more practical developments, yeah, I think uh, um, you know those are those are some of the developments that most excited me. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. I I loved reading your last blog post. I know mm. we've all been busy with the conference, but I highly recommend reading it. Mm. Um, it was a great great analysis of this. But let's dive in more to the quantum supremacy. So mm. in 2019, Google had the quantum advantage experiment. A few other groups, like you mentioned, Zandu carried out their own experiments. Um, but these experiments are really not free of that criticism. And on that blog, you talked about the random circuit sampling. Mm -hmm. And even though the authors themselves did not claim breaking quantum mm -hmm. advantage, some other people mm -hmm. say that it might have refuted that. So mm -hmm. how do we actually clearly establish quantum supremacy? And what do you think is what we need to do to get to that phase? Yeah, well, well I think that... Uh, um the, the, you know, you, uh, um, um, often it's just a matter of reading what the paper actually says, right? Uh, you know, rather than just, you know, trying to get some kind of vague zeitgeist or, you know, vague feeling about it. Uh, so, uh, you know, the thing is, like, like, from the very beginning of this quest to demonstrate, you know, quantum advantage, supremacy, whatever, in the, in the NISC era, uh, you know, we, we, we knew that we were playing a game where, you know, fundamentally it doesn't scale. Right, you know, like like we might be able to do this with 50 qubits or 100 qubits, but uh, uh, you're not going to scale to a thousand qubits because if you did, then you know, presumably you would want depth, an enormous circuit depth to get all your qubits to talk to each other. Okay, but the the uh, signal that you can read out when you make a measurement 
If your qubits are not error corrected, then your signal is going to de degrade exponentially as a function of the depth, right? So when the depth becomes too large, you just can't read the signal anymore. Your, your, your signal to noise ratio is, uh, is, 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 is negligible. Um, so, uh, so we knew that ultimately what you need is quantum error correction, right? And hopefully, you know, that message has come through loud and clear through, you know, many of the talks that you've uh, uh, been to over the past three days, right? Ultimately, scaling will require error correction. Okay, so we've been playing a game where we hope to eke out, you know, some advantage before that era uh, uh, that, you know, that at least puts the ball in the skeptic's court, right? At least makes it, you know, gives them the challenge of saying, okay, if you don't believe that quantum computing can ever work, right? Well, you know, it seems like, you know, uh, uh, how do you explain the results of this experiment, right, without talking about a two to the 50th dimensional Hilbert space, you know, that was actually involved in the computation, right? You know, just today I was arguing with people on my blog who were, you know, you know and uh, making this point, right? I think, I think, uh, these experiments have put the, 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 the ball in, in their court, and, and, th and that was the original point, right? So, so now what the, the new work by Haranov, Vazirani et al., uh, what that has done is to sort of nail down the conclusion uh, a little bit more rigorously that indeed, you know, uh, it's not going to scale. You know, the, the quantum advantage will not scale to more and more qubits without error correction. There was a little loophole in that statement that we, you know, did not know how to rigorously justify. Namely, like, what about when the circuit depth is neither too large nor too small? Like, you know, if the circuit depth is constant, then we, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and the, cir the, uh, cir the gates are geometrically local, then we know how to simulate the thing using tensor network methods. Uh, if the circuit depth is too high, then, you know, the noise is too great. Okay, but if the circuit depth was like logarithmic in the number of qubits, then we didn't know how to rule out that, uh, 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 that random circuit sampling could give you a quantum advantage, even that would scale. To, to arbitrary numbers of qubits with no error correction. And so, you know, using sophisticated techniques, they've now ruled that out. Okay, but it's, it's important to understand that, you know, this, this proves a conjecture that, you know, everyone in the, uh, uh, working in the field, I think, would have made. It doesn't disprove a conjecture. Okay, so, um, yeah. Okay, great. So, how do we get there, I guess? So what fields do you think in the quantum space have been overserved versus underserved? Uh, you and I probably remember very well the QAOA craze a few <laughs> years ago where every paper, you know, every day was QAOA. Is, 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 is that over? I, you're, you're speaking well, about it in the past tense. I know. Well, maybe, <laughs> but I'm seeing less of it these days. All um, right. Some of, some of the years were a lot, but uh, yeah, have have we gone too deep in QAOA, <laughs> or um, not deep enough in other parts that will get us to that quantum supremacy that we need? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, the the the, the kind of thing that I always want to see less of is you know the uh, papers where where they say you know we we. We, we do such and such with a quantum computer, right? We show how you can do uh, machine learning, optimization, finance, this or that, and they don't even ask the question of, well, how does it compare against, you know, what you could have done with a classical computer, right? And where sort of the entire case seems to depend on just no one, no one you know, everyone tacitly agreeing to not ask that question. Right. You know, as, as obvious as that sounds, you know, I feel like that still describes like at least 15 to 20 percent of all of the papers that I see on the quant pH archive. OK. And, and I'm always hoping to see less of that. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, in terms of what I'd like to see more of. Right. I mean, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I always get get interested when I see a paper that just sort of steps back and, you know, looks for a new kind of quantum speed up. You know, just like the, this example by uh, uh, the work by Yamakawa and Jandri that I mentioned earlier, right? Even if it's not immediately useful for anything that I can see, right? You know, I'm way more excited about a, a new kind, you know, a sort of fundamental new source of quantum speed up, uh, uh, um, you know, that, 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 that then we can think about what it is good for than I am about, you know, someone who starts with, you know, what they want 
like some you know, finance application or some vehicle routing application, and then um, you know, tries to uh, uh, you know, say, well, well, here's the quantum algorithm to do it, and, you know, and, and uh, uh, as long as no one asks too hard about you know, how, uh, uh, as long as no one pushes too hard on how well could we have done the same thing classically, you know, we can impress people by saying that we did this with a quantum computer. So we've talked a lot about yeah. the algorithm side, but yeah. what about the hardware side? Have you seen any great accomplishments this year? And what are you kind of looking for, that canary in the coal mine of when you're going to start re getting really excited about this being actually applied to hardware? Uh, well, look, I mean, I mean I, I've been excited enough for 20 plus years to, you know, spend my career working in this field, right? right? Uh, uh, so, um, but, you know, uh, uh, you know, with, with, uh, um, you know, quantum, the, the, the sort of uh, uh, first quantum supremacy experiments now, you know, three years uh, old, uh, I think, you know, it, it's, it's clear to most people in the field what the next steps are. Uh, you, know, uh, um, you know, demonstrate quantum error correction, just keep a, a logical qubit alive for a long time you know, demonstrate that you can do that, you know, against both X errors and Z errors, uh, you know, that you can uh, do fault tolerant operations. You know, of course, many groups are, are working, you know, are racing toward trying to demonstrate that. But I would also stress, uh, uh, you know, do better quantum supremacy experiments. You know, I do not regard that as a done deal, right? Because, you know, again, classical spoofers have gotten better and better. Right now, on the, you know, what I would really like, uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, when the hardware people uh, come, you know, th this is something that we have not yet managed to solve for them, but to figure out how to do near-term quantum supremacy experiments where the answer can also be efficiently verified using a classical computer. Right, where you don't have to calculate this linear cross entropy score, which takes an exponential amount of time on a classical computer in order to verify the results. Uh, I, th you know, I think you know, the, the current generation of quantum supremacy experiments are inherently limited to you know, 60 qubits, let's say, because beyond that, we don't even know how to verify the answer. So you know, I'm, I, you know, I have some ideas for how we're going to go beyond that, but I think that will, will, will really take a new idea. Um, no. Great, so one last question for me before uh -huh. we get back to the audience. And mm -hmm. you know, obviously for everyone else, you know, send your quantum supremacy experiments to Scott to check up on before so you don't get a, a blog post about your paper, or maybe you want that. Um, so you've done amazing work at OpenAI so far, and you know, a big question is, are you coming back to quantum? When are you coming back, and are you gonna take well, any learnings um, back? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I guess I, 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 I never really left. I don't 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 tell my bosses at OpenAI that, but uh, uh, I uh, you know I'm no I mean I, I I still you know I'm I'm based in Austin mostly I still uh, run my research group I supervise my you know uh, uh, students and postdocs uh, we continue to write quantum computing papers. Uh, but you know, I'm not. I'm not teaching this year, and so I am. You know, spending the majority of my time uh, thinking about AI safety. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, quantum computing in some sense was my first love. You know, when I was a beginning grad student in 2000, I was actually deciding then whether to go into quantum computing or machine learning. Uh, those were those were my two main choices. And uh, um, you know, I, I already had a sense then that machine learning was going to be societally important on a shorter time scale. You know, this was a decade before the deep learning revolution started, right? So I didn't even know how important, but you know, it seemed like, and yet quantum computing was just more fun. Okay, because uh, you know, with machine learning, kind of everything was messy and empirical, right? And uh, you know, you could just sort of stare at graphs and try to, you know, infer what was going on, but there was never any theory to explain it. And with quantum computing, even though we were so far from having the actual devices, you know, we could understand so much about the various quantum algorithms and why they worked or, or didn't work. And so, you know, 20 some years later, I still feel like quantum computing is more fun. And um, so, you know, I don't know. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I just, I, 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 I tend to get drawn to problems that are fun as opposed to having any kind of coherent plan for 
you know, what I'm going to work on. All right, well, thank you so much for answering yeah. my questions. Um, and now we'd like to open it up to the audience. So ask all your, your questions for Scott. Hello, Scott. Hi. Um, it's an honor. Um, I wanted to ask you what are your thoughts on, I mean, it's an open question, but what are your thoughts on the classes of problems that are quantumly easy and classically hard to solve? So to be a bit more specific, um, using near-term devices, what area do you think quantum computing can have the most impact on? For example, yeah. uh, so so, so, so our, our best bet for near-term devices you know, remains what it was when Feynman started talking about quantum computing 40 years ago, right? namely simulating quantum physics, right? learning more about materials, uh, about uh, chemistry, as we heard in the very nice talk by Brigitte Whaley this morning. Um, you know, learning about uh, reaction rates, um, you, know, ho um, um, you know, hopefully, you know, learning about condensed matter physics, maybe even learning about quantum gravity. You know, for anyone who's wondering, I do not think we learned anything new from this uh, nine qubit simulation of a, of a wormhole, we quote didn't unquote. Open one? <laughs> what? <laughs> we didn't open one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if, if, if we did open a wormhole, then it's in a, a different universe, you know, not, <laughs> one, not, not one that we have any access to. Uh, Right, but uh, you know, some other people might equivalently describe the situation by just saying we ran a little quantum circuit on nine qubits, right? And we and we knew perfectly well what the outcome was going to be. So I mean, this is you know, uh, like like when when this is the thing, like when you do when you know when you sort of design a quantum circuit or a quantum protocol, and then but then you feel like well maybe people won't you know, pay enough attention or it won't get into nature, you know, unless I actually run it on a quantum computer, even though I know full well what, what the result is going to be, like this has less of the character of an experiment, more the character of a PR stunt, right? And so, um, uh, so, but um, having said that, you know, once you can scale up to devices with, you know, 100 qubits, 200 qubits, uh, you know, we will be able to test out models of condensed matter physics, even, you know, uh, theoretical models of quantum gravity in a way that might tell us something that we didn't already know. And, and that is genuinely uh, an interesting prospect and, and, and ironically one, one of the earliest things that we might be able to do with quantum computers just because, uh, uh, um, you know, it, with, with, with chemistry, for example, there's all sorts of messy details that you have to get right because you have to match observed reality, right? With quantum gravity, you can just make up the model. I always joke that a the first quantum computer mm. may build a better quantum computer. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. That, uh, okay. So you could say that that's the other main, main application of near-term quantum computers, namely learn about the problem of building a quantum computer, right? It's kind of like the main application of sending humans to space, right? Which is to learn about how to send humans into space. Hi, Scott. Over here? Yeah. No, over to your left. Hi. Hi. Mark Mattingly, Scott is my name. I have a question about, uh, you mentioned that um, uh, quantum computing is um, interesting because it's fun. Um, my question is about the commercialization of quantum computing. Mm. Uh, do you think about that? What do you think about that? And uh, I won't ask you the question, when do you think it's going to be commercially viable? Because the answer is always in five years. But what do you think is going to happen between now and it actually becoming commercially viable? Uh, so I certainly think about it. I mean, you know, often I'm thinking about it in the context of someone has claimed to, you know, uh, have something that is already commercially useful, and it's based on, you know, statements that are, you know, that 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 insofar as we can evaluate them seem to be false, and then I get emails about it, and then I have to write a blog post about it. So. Um, but uh, uh, I think that um, you know I am I am uh, cautiously optimistic that you know within the next decade we will see the first you know quantum uh, computations that are actually useful for learning about various quantum systems. You know I think maybe first we will see things that are scientifically interesting, you know, or that teach us something new about materials. And then maybe we will start to see things that are also commercially interesting, right? You know, what, what tends to irk me is when people kind of jump 
you know, try, are, are, are seeming to sort of jump the queue here, right? Where like we haven't even esta clearly established the reality of any quantum speed up at all, even for something completely useless, you know, let alone for something scientifically interesting, let alone for something commercially useful. And then they're already talking about, you know, working with Volkswagen to, you know, uh, optimize vehicle routing. Well, it's like, you know, let's, 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 you know, do the, like, like if, if, if you were actually going to beat classical here, then, then you would have been able to do all of these earlier steps in the process, right? Which are still, you know, huge unsolved challenges. Okay, so, so, so that, that tends to be my feeling about it. Now, uh, you know, when I look at the various quantum startups today, um, you know, some of them I'm actually very enthusiastic about, and I hope that they, you know, uh, you know I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not like investing my own money in them, but, you know, uh, you know, then again, I'm not a venture capitalist, right? My money is just sits in the bank doing nothing, okay? Um, uh, uh, you, know, you know, certainly there are startups where I feel like they're, you know, they're, you're like, like, yeah, they're, they're taking a big risk, but I hope that they succeed, right? But, uh, but usually when I'm asked to, you know, judge some startup, like I'm judging something different than, than maybe most people would, which is I'm looking at, you know, like I can't judge all kinds of things about the, you know, quantum computing startups, about their, their hardware, about uh, their plans for the future. I can just, you know, judge the statements that they make now about quantum algorithms you know, and see if they're true or not, right? Or if they, if they let's say, comport with known knowledge. And, you know, if they're saying uh, things that, 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 I, that, I, that I know are false or wildly exaggerated, then that gives me less confidence, of course, about the parts that I can't judge. You know, and conversely, if they're careful about the things I can judge, then I have more confidence. Mm. Hi. Uh, uh, oh. Oh. Sorry? You had mentioned... Can you hear me? It's working? Uh, I can hear. Okay. You had mentioned uh, in the uh, 20 years ago where mm -hmm. you were deciding to go one way or another. And during that time, you wrote a very interesting paper on uh, how, who can name the biggest number. Yeah. Right? And, and therein, you discussed the busy beaver mm -hmm. problem, right? Mm -hmm. And how huge it gets. Mm -hmm. But you, and you never mentioned in there how it gets so big. I mean, you mentioned in there Rado, who invented, who invented it in ni the game in 1960, and if, if I remember right, he said, Beaver, busy number, number four or five is something humanity can never know. So uh, well, busy I beaver five, we might know. Uh, uh, it, in fact, there's a conjecture that it's about 47 million. Uh, busy beaver of six is at least uh, 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10, and so on 15 times. And, and there, okay. is, there is my question in that paper. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that intriguing effect, uh -huh. but you never explained how it well, gets so big. How is okay. that possible? All right, all right, fine. Well, so th th this question has nothing to do with quantum computing. Let's be clear. Uh, ask me anything, though, right? Yeah, yeah, fine, fine, <laughs> fine, fine. I didn't say I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say I wasn't going to answer it. Uh, so, um, uh, um, you know, so by the way, I, I would not have mentioned in 1999 that Busy Beaver of Six is that enormous because that wasn't known at the time. Okay, that was only discovered actually within the past year, okay, which is, uh, which is kind of a cool discovery. But as for how, so, so the busy beaver of N is defined as the largest finite number of steps that can be taken by a Turing machine with N steps. So basically think of like the largest number of things that an N line or an N bit computer program can do if it has to halt afterward. Okay, and what you can prove is that this function uh, grows as a function of n grows faster than any computable function. Okay, we know that because uh, if, if it were computable, then you could uh, use that to solve the halting problem, right? Which, but, you know, the, Alan Turing proved was impossible. So, so, so in some sense, that gives you the abstract reason why it has to grow ridiculously fast because otherwise you could use it to solve the halting problem, okay? But if you want to be a little more concrete, you could say, look, you can, you know, encode, and, and, and actually someone did this not long ago, you can build a, like a 27-state Turing machine that halts if and only if there is a counterexample to the Goldbach conjecture. It says every even number four or greater is the sum of two primes, right? And so to, in order to know even just busy beaver of 27, you would have to settle Goldbach's conjecture, 
Okay, so this one function, it sort of encodes in, in it, you know, a large fraction of all of mathematics. And in some sense, that is the reason why it has to grow as quickly as it does. Yes, that is what I said. I, I don't, I, 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 sorry, I don't know how to answer that question. Okay. I mean, it's kind of like saying, you know, you know, you know, you said why two plus two is four, but how is it four? It's like, you know, I don't know what, what to do with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Hi, Dr. Aronson. Um, quick question. You were just at the Institute of Advanced Study. Yes. Bits, I was wondering if there were any interesting takeaways, anything that you found interesting there. want to hear your thoughts. Uh, yeah, no, it was, it was super interesting. Uh, you know, I was at the meeting of this uh, a community called, called It From Qubit. Uh, and, um, you know, there were a lot of talks, uh, actually, uh, um, not, not, um, um, both about quantum gravity, about the black hole information problem, but also talks about quantum computing theory from, you know, about quantum supremacy experiments and so forth from uh, um, 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 Umesh Vazirani spoke and uh, uh, others who might be familiar to, to some people here. Um, you know, there, there was a, a very nice talk by Bill Pfefferman about uh, a new notion called pseudo-entanglement. So they've now shown how you can pre prepare quantum states that are indistinguishable from highly entangled states, even though they're not highly entangled, even though there are, the amount of entanglement in them is actually very small. Uh, that seems like a potentially useful notion. You know, and again, it could be useful for all sorts of purposes just within quantum information, uh, but their, their motivation for it originally came from quantum gravity. So it's been kind of amazing to see how these two fields have, have come together. Now, there was a discussion, and I should say some dispute, at this workshop about this recent uh, 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 experiment that you know some people have, have misstated as having created a wormhole on the, the Google Sycamore chip, um, you know, and 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 I think uh, uh, you know, sort of no one no one who understands actually disagrees about the relevant facts which is, you know, that, you know, it's just some nine qubit quantum circuit, right? Uh, uh, but they disagree about how to talk about it. Uh, you know, some people say, well, we should, we should praise it. You know, it's exciting and, and, and maybe it'll, you know, lead to more in the future. And other, you know, others of us are very concerned that, you know, if the public gets the impression that, you know, these physicists are creating to, or are, are, are claiming to have, you know, opened up a wormhole in the lab, and then they, they learn the details and they find out that it is, you know, nothing at all like they thought it was, then, you know, they're going to lose trust in the enterprise of physics itself. And, you know, and, and so we ought to be very, very clear about what has and hasn't actually been accomplished. So uh, I have a question. Uh, so the right. Nobel Prize was awarded for entanglement this year? Yes. Do you think that topic is closed or there's still very interesting research around entanglement, like emergent effects mm. for a, a million qubits, for example? Uh, yeah, I think that entanglement as a whole is sort of a permanent part of physics, right? It is, you know, uh, I, I, mean, I mean, everything that we do in quantum computing, you know, whether we mention it expli explicitly or not, right, we are, you know, trying to understand, you know, the, uh, 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 what you can do with these highly entangled states on millions of qubits. Those questions are not going away. Okay, now, now this Nobel Prize was specifically for, you know, the experiments that sort of demonstrated the reality of two-particle entanglement. Like, for example, via the, the, the violation of the Bell inequality or the, the CHSH inequality, right? And, you know, that, that's something that like, many of us have thought was a, a way overdue Nobel Prize, right? It could have been given 20 or 30 years ago, but it's, you know, like, like usual, the way to, you know, to win, you know, the, the, the Nobel Prize in physics is like a biathlon, right? You have to, one, do something that deserves the Nobel Prize, and then two, stay alive for long enough, right? <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, but, uh, but, but, uh, but okay, but I, I would say that in terms of the violation of the Bell inequality, you know, I would say with the experiments in 2015, which simultaneously closed the locality loophole and the detection loophole, I would say that all of the quote unquote sane loopholes to uh, the Bell inequality violation have now been closed. 
Okay, all that remains is the utterly insane loophole, which is called super determinism, right? Which is basically the idea that, well, like, if you just uh, treated the entire universe as a, as a conspiracy theory, right? And said that, you know, ever, ever since the Big Bang, it was predetermined what experiments we were going to do and so forth, then you can explain away the, the violation of the bell inequality. But then, you know, you like, the cure is a billion times worse than the disease. Right, so you know, I think that that uh, uh, you know, insofar as physics can ever establish anything, I think that with the fully loophole-free Bell experiments, yes, it is now established the physical reality of quantum entanglement, and we can at least move on from that question. Related to your work right now in AI safety, mm. what can we learn from your experience there on quantum safety and the much more? early stage than we, than we addressed it in AI? Uh, well, I, I mean, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not confident that, that, that quantum safety, you know, really raises kind of novel issues, you know, that, that are, are different from those raised by classical safety, right? I mean, you know, you want to, like, you know, I like to say, you know, a, a quantum computer is not exactly like a nuclear weapon, right? It probably won't kill anyone unless the dilution refrigerator tips over onto them or, or, <laughs> or, or, or something like that, right? Uh, um, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean if certainly there will be national security issues that, that come into play once you have scalable quantum computers that can break uh, 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 public key crypto systems. Okay, and those are, those are already being discussed. You know, sort of in principle, we know how to respond to those things, you know, with uh, post-quantum cryptography, but, you know, it will be uh, a struggle to get everyone to adopt that and to, to sort of agree on standards for that. Um, you know, I mean, that, 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 that's the closest that I can think of to a quantum safety issue, right, is just the, 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 you know, the move to post-quantum cryptography. You know, other than that, it's, you could say it's just you know, a new kind of computer that will be you know, super fast for certain things. Uh, uh, you know, now with, 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 with AI, you know, the worry specifically is you, know, you, give, you, you slightly misspecify what its goal is, and then it's intelligent enough to think creatively about how to accomplish that goal, even if that means plotting against you or you know, doing something wildly different from what you intended. 